We are joined by Charles Woodall, Senior Vice President of Alliances and Channels for Salesforce Asia Pacific. Charles has 25 years of sales experience, the last 20 years focused on customer experience in the, infer in the IT sector. During his career in IT, he has worked directly and indirectly across multiple industry segments, including the financial sector, telecommunications, government, and resources. We're also joined by Simon Peterson, Managing Director of Operations for Financial Force, Australia, New Zealand. Simon brings more than 25 years of international experience in the software industry and joined Financial Force after serving as Chief Revenue Officer and General Manager of Property IQ. Prior to his time as the VP of Commercial Sales for ANZ at Salesforce.com, Simon spent 20 years with SAP in Australia, North America, and Europe in various roles from consulting, operations, and senior sales leadership. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of experience today on the webinar. So let's launch into some of the questions. Um, Charles, can you tell us a little bit more about the term channel partnerships? We're hearing it more and more frequently, but if you could just provide an overview of what, of what channel partnerships really means, that would be really helpful. So, um, channel partnerships has traditionally been defined, uh, I think, in the marketplace as uh, either system integrator partners, global system integrators, um, ISVs, etc. But I think today, We've seen a convergence of partnerships. Um, I think we're seeing customers becoming partners. Uh, we're seeing the global system integrators becoming ISVs for the first time. Um, so we're actually seeing people creating digital assets within the marketplace as well. So um, channel partners now actually think really defines what is the best alternative route to market other than a direct route to market. And it's something that Salesforce is extremely focused on. You know, I, I touched for a moment on, on Australia being a big market for Salesforce, but if you could give some background on just exactly how big the Salesforce ecosystem is in Australia, I think that would really help the audience to understand. Sure. So Australia is a, a top 10 market uh, for Salesforce globally. Um, we've, we've got a really broad, extensive, extensive range of uh, customers in, in Australia. So ranging sort of from airline customers, such as sort of Qantas, through to not-for-profit customers in sort of the uh, Starlight Children's Foundation and universities, we have RMIT and Monash, all the way through down to sort of one and two person companies as well. So we actually have a very, very diverse uh, and broad customer base. We have around 2000 staff uh, in the Australian business now as well. So uh, pretty amazing growth, which I've seen in the three and a half years, which uh, I've been with Salesforce in, in, in country. Uh, we're projected to grow that to around 4,000 people, which is why we've, uh, we're just building the Salesforce Tower in Sydney. So it's our first actually dedicated uh, building in the Australian marketplace, which is exciting. And if you look at the Salesforce economy, um, if you look at what IDC is predicted between sort of 2019 and 2024, we're expecting over 42,000 jobs to be stimulated by the Salesforce economy, which sort of equates to sort of $25 billion in net new revenues in the marketplace. So it's, it's a really robust market. Fantastic. And just for additional clarity on that topic, are you serving, is Salesforce serving um, Asia Pacific out of Australia? So uh, Australia itself, so we have our, our leadership team um, is predominantly now in uh, based out of Singapore. So we actually have a sort of, uh, probably around a sort of 60, 40 split between the Singapore market as it expands into the Asia Pacific marketplace. And we actually have uh, probably 40% uh, domiciled in the Australian marketplace. So now to, to kind of launch into some, some questions for Simon. So f um, financial force expanded to Australia quite a few years ago at this point. What about Australia appealed to financial force? And are you seeing kind of what initially appealed come to fruition uh, as you continue to grow. Thanks, Jessica. Um, look, I think it, it's really interesting. I've been with um, Financial Force now for about three and a half years, and I think the intent to take a, a software company like Financial Force down to Australia, first and foremost, relied on, I guess, the beachhead being set by Salesforce. Um, we, we provide uh, ERP um, software on inside the Salesforce platform. So fundamentally, we needed a, uh, a customer base to address. And I think the uh, vast majority of our customer base is really leveraging our relationship with Salesforce. So in terms of the opportunity, I think the, the, the addressable market in ERP globally is, is massive. 
Um, in terms of the Australian market, as, as a, I guess, a, a relatively young ERP company, predominantly English language, et cetera, um, we, ha we had operations in the UK and the US. And I think very naturally, uh, the Australian New Zealand market, same language, same basic cultural uh, nuances, et cetera, was, it was absolutely a natural market for um, financial force to open up in. Um, I think over the last three years, uh, a lot of effort has really been into establishing a beachhead actually locally here. I think probably for the first six or nine months, we tried to address the Australian market out of the US and the UK. Very, very early on, um, we realised that was a, a, a not necessarily the right way to go to market. And so we've, we've spent the last three and a half years really establishing a local present, local branding, local relationships. Yeah, we. Um, it's interesting. We we come acro across quite a few companies that that try to serve Australia out of the United States, and I think then come to terms with the fact that that is quite challenging. It's really a face to face culture. Um, even now with with COVID, I think that's that's still actually true. Um, and so uh, I'm 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 not surprised by that. And I think it's a very interesting strategy. And I'm I'm curious, kind of both um, for. Uh, for Charles and for Simon to get a better understanding of how how Salesforce, so a lot of companies are moving to Australia to, to support not only Australia, but each Pacific. So how would one work with Salesforce in terms of growing not only in Australia, but also in APAC? What does that relationship look like, I guess? Or what do those relationships look like? Uh, for, for us, um, being a, an ISV of, of Salesforce's, um, the relationship with Salesforce is absolutely fundamental. And I think uh, I, I worked for Salesforce for three years. So I had a very good understanding of the culture, the leadership, etc. But I think for any organisation looking to come into the market down here, um, step one is build a relationship um, with, with Salesforce. It, it's, it's an interesting, the metaphor I use um, is, you know, Salesforce is a little bit like the sun. Um, I'm an ISV and, and I'm, I'm like a moon revolving around that sun. So I think the, the, the better I get engaged and, and the better I understand the nuances of, of Salesforce, um, the better I'll be. So, you know, to take a, a, an interesting uh, approach, I think um, Salesforce has spent the last couple of years really focused on um, being what they call a customer success platform and focusing on uh, customer 360. And that's obviously in, in, in software circles, CRM, uh, all, all of the front office type things. And I think um, for, for an organization like ours, we, we need to understand how we augment that Salesforce marketing pitch. I think that the worst thing we could do would be to come out with something separate to Salesforce, a different marketing pitch. So um, we, we spent a lot of time enabling our sales teams and delivery teams in uh, the Salesforce marketing message, so we can all be singing, I guess, very, very similar message, but then financial force, what, what do we do to add value on top of Salesforce? So I think that's very much the focus that I've taken. I've never, I've never looked at this as the sun before, to be honest as well, but I actually, <laughs> as I, if, I, if I look at the, uh, the ecosystem, um, which is required to, to make Salesforce sort of okay. successful, especially in, in this marketplace, Look, I, I think um, having a plan, uh, is, it sounds simple, but actually having a plan on what you want to do in the marketplace, understand what your differentiator is um, within the market. Are you going to be focused on specific clouds, um, spe uh, specific verticals? I mean, that could be uh, commerce cloud with actually sort of FMCG or fast moving consumer goods. Uh, it could be you're building applications um, to take to the marketplace. I think we've seen the most successful partnerships recently um, really develop their own assets. So actually understanding where there are gaps in the marketplace, which are either accretive to Salesforce um, in the 360 cloud, or actually something which differentiates them in the market. I mean, Deloitte's been a great example of that. The ISV community has been a great example of that as well. So uh, also look towards sort of how you actually want to uh, show up in the market. I think. Having a blended model of offshore, nearshore um, is still, uh, I think it's still well received in the Australian marketplace in an APAC, but you do need to have that local footprint. And I think that's critical across the whole region. Absolutely. You actually brought up something interesting that I initially had not been in the questions, but you, you kind of talked a little bit about designing for the market itself. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, th there's a, one of the, large growing parts of Australia is really the small to medium enterprise segment. And so I'm curious if you've seen 
businesses come in and almost design strategically to target that particular customer versus have a, a different offering for, for enterprise? I guess if they're coming into the market, realizing a need for innovation and then actually creating net new products to serve um, the Australian market and small to medium enterprise. I think 100%. I think the uh, a number of companies approach the marketplace initially with, okay, we're going to focus on enterprise. We're going to focus on the top 200 or 500 companies. Um, the reality is as well that there is a huge uh, open marketplace uh, in the mid marketplace. And that goes across the whole region from SMB all the way through to what we define as, as mid market today. So um, companies actually have the agility to be able to pivot and work in that place have been really, really successful. And, and we're looking at alternative routes to market there today. We're looking at uh, do we resell through the partner ecosystem today? Do we, do we carve out whole segments of the market? And in an Asia Pacific case, do we actually carve out whole countries and just make them partner led marketplaces? I mean, over 80% of our transactions globally, um, uh, sorry, in Asia Pacific are, are transacted through our partners and 71% in the Australian marketplace. So it's a, it's a critical part to our growth in the ecosystem and mid market plays a great role. Uh, Charles, I 100% agree with that. I think uh, it's interesting. We uh, are taking a very similar view on that. I think we've got parts of the APAC market where we're looking to go pure resale. Uh, we just can't scale fast enough. And, and I think we, we to address the demand, um, we've built our own ecosystem. So, um, and, and I think it, it's just a replication, a smaller replication of what Salesforce has done uh, in the region. There's a lot they've done very well. We just, we pick the things that they've done very well and repeat them. Um, I think to, to your comment about, you know, mid-market and, and tweaking products, et cetera, um, if you, if you, stand in the US and look at Australia. Australia very much is a, a mid-market country um, and, and obviously upper mid-market. And I think, uh, you know, I think in the US there are, you know, thousands of very, very large organisations. So it's a, it's a viable segment to bet your business on. But I think if you're uh, looking to grow, certainly in the Australian New Zealand market, um, small, medium, medium to large, that's where you need to focus. And yes, we've got the very large organisations like BHP, Qantas, et cetera, um, but there are not thousands of them. So I think you, you, need, a, it, you need to build a, a volume model as well as a value model in terms of getting to those markets. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really, really key point because I, I, I often feel like there is a desire to come to Australia to serve enterprise but what people really sometimes miss out on is just how big that that sme market is and and also the need to serve it in a very different way um in australia you know than even you may in the united states uh it's a, it's a very different ball game i think um so my my next question is kind of focused on you know when you you know, I see a lot of obviously North American companies launch offices in Australia, but how would you, and, and both of you, I think have ample experiencing uh, regarding this question, but how would you see the pace of digital adoption in Australia compared to the United States? I know we see a lot of people kind of using Australia as a test market, and I'm wondering kind of how do you, how do you compare the pace of adoption in both places? Sure. Um, look, the, the, the old joke is you, you try something, if you're an American software company, you, you try it out in Australia, if it fails miserably, nobody anywhere else in the world is going to know about it. So I think that's that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, baseline, but I, I don't think it's like that. I think it's um, Australians tend to adopt technology quite quickly. Um, and I think our Kiwi friends across the Tasman probably are even more so in terms of um, that, that, that approach. But I think the Australian New, New Zealand market is, is a market that respects innovation, wants to adopt innovation. But I think fundamentally, we, we don't buy innovation for its own sake. We buy it for the outcome um, that it delivers to our business. So it, it's really, I think, very important to look at the marketplace down here as one that understands digital adoption that will absolutely take on innovation. Uh, but I think the way you uh, sell in the Australian market is nuanced. Um, I think that uh, certainly I, I've sold in North America and I sold in EMEA and I sold in Australia. And I think in general, Australians don't like to be sold to. Um, they like to be on that buying journey. And I think as a, as a salesperson, I really need to empathise with the buying journey. Um, and I need to be able to demonstrate uh, the problem that I'm solving, the value that I'm going to uh, deliver. Um, and, it, and it's very, very different 
uh, to my experience in, in, in selling in the US. And I think uh, as you launch down here and you think about sales methodology, you think about um, the way you want to enable and teach your salespeople, um, be very careful about taking exactly the same sales training that you do in North America and putting it into the Australian market. Um, there, are, there are nuances that uh, Australians will probably sit back and scratch their heads a little bit in terms of, do I really want to go that path? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting you say that, Simon. I've been, I've been fortunate to do business uh, globally and to have customers all over the world. Um, and it's been a, an amazing part of my, my journey. But I can always rely on uh, Australian customers to, uh, to keep me honest when I come home as well. And uh, they're extremely direct in nature. And uh, I think that's something which is pretty special about the Australian marketplace. But look, look overall, I think... Uh, Australia is very much an early adopter of new technologies. I think um, through my career there, Australia has been at the forefront of that. Um, the amount of innovation and the amount of IP which is actually built uh, in the Australian marketplace would surprise you. I think on what's actually exported out to the, um, to, to the world. And so I think there's many parallels you can draw between the technology space um, in Australia and also into the US as well. So there's a lot of similarities and commonality. Um, but the nuances probably come down to actually how you transact in the marketplace. Thank you. That both very thorough answers and kind of it reminded me of uh, of a particular topic that I think it would be I'm, I'm keen for for both of you to touch on, which is this concept of um, of tall poppy and tall poppy mentality and how that could possibly relate to just kind of the sales process and how you may want to be versus not want to be when you're selling into Australia. There's a lot of similarities between the US and Australia. One of the things that we are diametrically different around is uh, someone that is successful in the US is lauded and put on a pedestal. And I think that there's a lot of cultural reasons for that. Um, I think if you come down to Australia, it is precisely the reverse. Um, I think uh, as, as a culture, the tall poppy syndrome really references people that are seen to be really exceeding expectations and doing very well, um, the mass of the population that's not looks at that and resents it. And I think, um, you know, we, we've moved a lot from that, probably, you know, the, the 60s, 70s were, were a, lot of, a lot of that. It's still ingrained in our culture. So I think in the sales cycle, um, you cannot afford to be arrogant and you cannot, in, in your sales pitch, spend the first 25 minutes of your first meeting talking about how good your organisation is um, we just don't care. What we want to know is how you're going to solve the problems and how you're going to bring that innovation to help me do my job. I mean, that's probably the best way to, to describe that one. Look, I, um, just to add that, I think, look, it's, uh, it's, it's a very resilient marketplace as a result of that, though, as well. I, I, look, I think if you look at what's happened through COVID, um, the stimulus which has happened from the government has actually really taken off in the Australian marketplace as well. But if you, I mean, we, we saw unprecedented activity in certain sectors in the first quarter of this year. We saw probably record growth in the public sector um, this year. And it's it's sort of amazing. So the if you look at JPAC in Q1, it grew 26% year over year, which is amazing actually in, in sort of during the midst of um, COVID itself as well. So I think uh, definitely the nuances we should have, oh, how you go to market also make it a very robust and consistent marketplace as well. So. Mm -hmm. I, I'd echo what Charles said. I think from, from my perspective, we had one of the best quarters I've ever had the first quarter this year. Um, so I think it's about the right message. Um, I think you know the, the, the rest of this year is around understanding what the government has done in, to stimulate the economy, have a really good understanding of those parts of the economy that are kicking on and understand which parts are uh, obviously struggling because it's, it's very different depending on where you are and certainly geographically as well. And that is a is a very um, good entree to, to the next question, which I'm kind of going to adjust a bit um, because I have actually heard from quite a few software companies now that per capita, their success, companies that haven't even launched in Australia yet, that their success per capita in terms of like sales is actually much higher in Australia than it is in North America right now, which is actually speeding up their, their desire to actually launch in Australia officially. So um, my, my next question would be, how, when you approached Australia initially, um, you know, Simon, what, what was that go-to-market strategy like? What were the you know, top five things you needed to do? 
what were you looking at in terms of a of a you know an original you know your first hire and also was you know was the public sector a part of that decision making process and how to better serve the public sector Sure, a lot, lot of question in there. Uh, look, I think the top five things I was looking at as we as we came into the market, we don't have five, but I think you know number one was to establish a beachhead relationship with Salesforce, and we've, we've already talked about that. Number two was really understanding uh, the addressable market in Australia, both geographically and by industry and by organisation size. Um, just an interesting nuance when I'm when I'm working with people in in the US that haven't necessarily worked in Australia a lot. When when you actually describe the land mass of Australia, we're about the same size as the uh, as the United States. So um, you guys, you know, obviously San Francisco to to New York, that's that's about the breadth of our country. But but nobody lives in the middle. Um, so it's very nuanced. And I think Amazon, when they first came to Australia, had to get over the whole distribution model for a country that nobody lives in the centre of. Uh, in terms of great numbers. So it's a, it's a very different uh, approach. So you need to think of the geography. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, our first hire, who do we hire? How do we build that beachhead? Um, it was an interesting one. When I was first approached to do the, to come do this job, um, there were probably two or three people, very opportunistic. Um, when when opportunity came, they went and prosecuted it. Um, not not a great way to start. And I think the first thing I did was build up a uh, a local support presence, uh, obviously a local sales presence. Um, but the reason I mention support is as a competitive differentiator. Um, you have a you, you, I'm selling software to clients. They go live. They're happy. Now there's always going to be a post go live relationship. So customer success management and, and support. One of the things that um, was core to my belief is the value proposition in selling software is beyond the initial sale, beyond the deployment. It's about that you know lifetime value. So if I could demonstrate that I had. Um, customer success and support people in country in the right time zone uh, that understand the nuances of the market. That that's certainly something that differentiated me from from other people. Um, look, I think the the next thing was uh, understanding how I would spend my marketing dollars. Um, the 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 um, brand awareness it was obviously fundamental. Um, but what I have found is the multiplier um, or the best return on investment from a market. And is, is really how I leverage the relationship with Salesforce. So Salesforce is an incredibly well-respected brand in Australia. They, they have a, a marketing budget down here that has probably a few more zeros than mine does. Um, so I, I, I leverage that relationship. They run every year in March Salesforce World Tour where they get you know, 12, 13,000 people to an event for a day. Um, as an ISV in that ecosystem, uh, that's that's a huge kickstart to my year. Um, and then obviously we run webinars, et cetera. And what I try and do, uh, we're actually running, running a webinar on uh, professional services later today, and we're doing it with Salesforce. So I've got two of Salesforce's customers that are also joint customers with myself, and we're running that with Salesforce. And that's obviously uh, a fantastic way of doing it. it. It raises my profile within Salesforce, but I'm also talking to um, prospects at the same time. So it's just a clever use of marketing funds. Um, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we're coming to the end and because uh, this has been such a good conversation. So we're gonna go with one of the questions that was on the um, Slido, which is, um, what are what are the top considerations uh, when choosing channel partners for B2B SaaS in and around APAC? For us, it's actually very much customer led. Um, so we put customers at the center of any decisions which we make. And if I look towards how many partners, what skill sets, um, what investments are required in the region, I look at customer demand. Um, we've actually got quite clever about it. Now we actually look at sort of rolling demand over a six to 12 month period from our customer base and look at the trends and then provide the guidance back to the ecosystem as well. So we, we predominantly look at that. And to my earlier points, have a plan, have a, have a look at a, a niche. And I think the, the market's changing as well um, from a single cloud implementation to someone who actually wants to embrace uh, cross cloud and start looking at Salesforce as a platform. Um, so that would be key as well. I think that uh, there's opportunity in the market. The, the market is a busy market, but it's by no means crowded. This is such a good, there's so much good information here. Um, 
Uh, and so I guess we, we only have one minute left, so I'll just do a bit of a wrap up. First and foremost, I wanted to thank um, both Charles and Simon for their insights. You know, clearly, um, every time I hear how many people Salesforce has in the market, I'm, I'm constantly like, impressed and yet not depressed at the same time. Um, so uh, I think, you know, what we heard is, is the importance of partnering with Salesforce, um, the various ways one can partner with Salesforce, as well as partnering with Salesforce to better serve um, APAC. We also heard about the, the value of channel partnerships in general, um, especially in, in Australia and in APAC. And I think we, we touched a little bit on some of the cultural differences uh, across borders, which are very, very important, because I definitely think there's a lot of perceptions from the um, North American market about um, carrying over practices from North America to Australia. So we turned around some of those assumptions, um, talked about how we can use training to turn around some of those assumptions, and also just talked about, um, obviously, the customer being king, you know, which is a consistent message, I think, across both places, but um, using the customer as kind of the gauge whether or not to decide to partner with someone. And clearly, obviously, given the fact that Salesforce has such a big presence with so many customers in Australia, both public and private, you know, they make a great partner uh, to, to launch into Australia and APEC. So once again, thank you very much. This has been great. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch, I'm sure, at some point soon. And just for anyone kind of listening in on the call, if you're interested in learning more about Austrade or Salesforce or Financial Force, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. And uh, I know I'd love to chat and figure out how to better serve you on your market entry strategy. So thank you so much. Take care.